illumination system and, and far superior than 2D x-rays looking at interproximal decay. And now it's actually a protocol in my office, which I'll touch on in my third case today. And then six years ago, we incorporated 3D diagnostics into our practice. And this, is, this has had the most profound effect of any instrumentation towards their diagnostics. So I'm gonna walk you through the path. And it's a crazy path how fast things change. 10 years ago, we would send our patients to a CBCT imaging center. They would be charged anywhere from three to $500 and I would get films sent back to me. Many of our endodontists at the time and oral surgeons, periodontal specialists did not own them 10 years ago. And then it would take time to get them to have an appointment. Then I'd have to wait for the information to be sent over. It was crazy 10 years ago. Then as recent as six years ago, we would send our patients to specialists who had their own comb beams. And then sharing the information from them was a challenge. They would burn a CD. I couldn't open up the CD. It was a pain in the butt. And even at that point, I really didn't know how to really read the information. We were sending out about 15 or 20 scans a month. We were placing our own implants. My two surgeons in our practice were placing them, but we had to send out for scans. And kind of, we felt as general dentists in the group, there were four of us, we were being dictated routinely, if we sent it out to a specialist, what did the specialist see? And they were the ones making the decisions. And that's not where I saw us going. So about six years ago, I bit the bullet in round one of CBCTs. The first one I bought, I leased for 72 months, it was $29.99 a month. And I, I tell you the story because it's important because if you haven't bought one yet, or if you're already looking at number two like we were, you'll understand the story. So in the first two years, I needed my system re recalibrated six times by Henry Shine. Nothing against Shine, it was the system. At one point, we were down three weeks. Ridiculous. The education from the company was spotty at best, and it was very challenging just to even take quality, consistent images for my team. And I was just tremendously disappointed. And three years ago, this company that I had never, ever heard of called Prexion approached Catapult, this education company that I founded and own where we have 30 evaluators, 30 speakers, and an additional 25 evaluators on top of those, so 50 in total. So we did a limited review of six, and it was a tough review. We had to install six comb beams in our offices and do like literally a three to six month review. At the end of the review, we all ended up, all six of us, selling our previous comb beams and then moving into this system of Prexion for $15.99 a month. And again, I tell you this because we were all already users and the names of the previous systems are unimportant. And I'll say this because the education and the support from Prexion has been ongoing and superlative. My practice now does 50 to 70 CBCTs a month. We no longer take an FMX. The standard scan we currently take is a 10 by eight. It used to be a five by five. And we now take five by fives really only for post-operative follow-ups or for endo by my endodontist in the office. We no longer take a Panorex. We, we, we send out the images of our CBCTs from our office to special. So if we have a patient who we're working on, they want us to work with a specialist outside. We send our images to them. Our specialists in our practice, they'll review our scans at the office or online through a portal. We have significantly cut down the time uh, patients need for consults. I, I think I've saved patients many fortunes of money. They don't have to go to an endodontist for a consult. They can look, they can see what we've got, we're probing and we're doing all the right things. So we avoid that secondary fee of an endo consult routinely and the travel involved. So with all that as a background, 
how do you best buy a CBCT? And I don't know who's got one and who doesn't, but I think buying a CBCT become, begins with a long-term relationship. I really do. And I mean, you're, this was the most expensive piece of equipment I bought. It's ongoing learning. You have to buy into a company that has ongoing learning and you gotta have a great rep. Our rep has been out to our office to train our team with updates and software when we have a new hire. If we're having any issues you know, with certain patients, she'll come in and do team training. There's always ongoing training, software updates, all of that. And I think a rep is essential. And then who are you buying from? If it's a big company, which there are many, is this one piece of their portfolio? And is it a significant piece where you're going to get taken care of great? If so, wonderful. I really believe the company has to be standing up for education and long-term relationships. I believe in the warranty and I believe the upgrades. I hate being nickeled and dimed. I hate it like most of you do. So I really believe companies must stand behind their product. Now the choice is for you on decision making. What kind of field of view do you want? So my endodontist who comes to my office one day a week, she only has one field of view. It's a five by five. I could never exist with a five by five field of view, never. My, one of my key associates, Tony, who's already spoken, he loves a 15 by 13 view so we can look at the joints. You have to understand what you're looking for and what field of view is gonna serve your needs. And does the cost equate to the value for those field of views? I just feel you need multiple fields of view. Then I go into the image quality. How good is the image quality? It's gotta be top notch. I wanna have multiple scanning modes, whether it's rapid set, standard, uh, high def. I think all of those become very patient specific and task specific. I'll show you that as we go forth today. And I think the scan's gotta be easy to take. First system was not easy to take and I think they're all getting much easier. Why, who wants to take a retake? You don't wanna do retakes and this is huge. People hate taking retakes. Speed of information conversion. My first system would often take two to three minutes to basically convert the information. I think if I can have my information converted in 30 seconds and I'm evaluating it right when the patient's there, or if the patient's going to sit down and I'm right there reviewing it, that's what I want. Many systems take way too long. And I don't need a complicated software. You'll see what we have. I mean, I want an ease of software that gives me what I need. And I'll just say this, technology is a great partner. But when it's not working right, it's the nightmare of a partner. And I can't have technology down like I had in my previous system. And I think the CBCTs just expand our opportunity in a plethora of different ways diagnostically in dentistry. It is not just about implants. It is not just about endo. I learned this from John Julian, who's already spoken in this series. And he, he basically guided me. I haven't taken FMX in three years. And we do not take FMXs in hygiene anymore. We worked that out in the morning huddle. Who's do for a scan instead of an FMX and every initial exam, never an FMX. And I think one of the challenges is ensuring each scan is read just like an FMX. And you have to make sure that you're reviewing in your notes or your chart that you have reviewed the scan. And I'm telling you, a lot of people don't do this. So here's what happens. A hygienist may we, the assistant will take the scan for the hygienist, you're busy, and then all of a sudden the next day, nobody read that scan. So in our morning huddle, part of our morning huddle is were all the scans read yesterday and were notes made? Because if no notes are made, that's negligent. So you just have to make sure you're making notes. What were your findings of that scan and confirm that you took the scan? And let's say you, this is a big fear. The biggest fear is, oh my God, this is a new technology and you need another eye. You need some, someone else looking at your scan. So there are many beam reading companies. There's CBCT readers, there's beam readers. There's just a, plus, there's just a number of companies and these are all oral maxillofacial radiologists. So what we do 
is if you see something, like I'll show you this first case. If you see something and you need to cover your butt or you don't know what it is, you send it out. So this is Ben, he's 58 years old and he's had a history, history of radiation treatment for tonsillar cancer. And the radiation was 7,000 gyres, which is a lot, to treat him. And obviously you're worried about osteoradial necrosis. So he came in as a new patient and I'm not gonna take an FMX and I scanned him. And that's when you just have your heart just swallow. I hadn't looked at his teeth yet. My initial exam routinely, I'm doing a precursory exam. I haven't probed or anything. So here's his scan. And here's his sagittal view. And you can immediately tell, you look at his history, tonsillar cancer, 7,000 gyres of radiation, and you are looking at something that is not good. And this is the sagittal view. So immediately I'm thinking, I'm gonna have to have a secondary consult. So this is the coronal view, front to back. You can almost see that the lingual cortex is already being perforated by this necrotic lesion that is expanding. This is the axial view. So this is the position I was in. I sent this view to two ENTs who were treating them and they were like not concerned. And I'm like, are you kidding me? How can we not be concerned? And when I told them that it wasn't just the lower left wisdom tooth, this encompassed all the way up to the canine, I needed justification in what I was saying. So I just, all you do is my front team, I have one person and they will upload the file and send it. So they basically just upload the file and send it digitally. And what you will get back is a report. And here is his report with his name blocked out. And it's a detailed report. And it, it will say, it will, it will go through all, all the things. And on the bottom, it says this is a poorly defined mixed density area noted in the left posterior mandible. And the lesion is more extensive than the 2019. So this was a second one I took, first one I took as his initial exam. And what was noted, of course, is that prompt medical referral and advancing MDCT is strongly recommended. And obviously, again, this is what you need. If you're not sure, this is how you wanna guide yourselves forward. Don't be fearful. I probably send one in 10 of my scans out. One in 10, it could be one in 15. The next fear, money and ROI. ROI I look at is twofold. First off, first, I have to tell you, the first way I look at ROI is you get far more case acceptance. When you're walking through a scan, and the way we do it, we have a digital image from iTero up, some bite wings up, but I walk everybody through this we get far more case acceptance and you actually see so much more that you can treat. And I think between the two, the ROI is unbelievable. I mean, we're doing 50 to 70 scans. If you do 15 scans and I'll get to pricing at 225 replacing an FMX, you're already making twice as much money as your payment monthly for your lease or your financing. And you're getting all this confirmed work so I don't see the money issue with the CBCT at all. And I believe that the more it, it, this provides you more information and allows you to avoid costly surprises because surpri nobody wants a surprise in dentistry. So I'll give you a case here and this is Murray. So Murray came in this year, he's 77 years old and he was in Egypt teaching. I put him on an antibiotic in Egypt. He came back with a lower anterior swelling. So it's a lower number or whatever, 26. That was, and you can see the periapical uh, changes. So now you're thinking, you're looking at it and you go, it's a lower anterior tooth. So what would I do? I put my rubber dam on in the past and then I'd start my access. And then I take my eight or 10 file, get my access and start way before I do my rotary. And all of a sudden, I'm now in there and my file's not going where I want it to. I hate that moment. So do you have enough information with the 2D image? And this is why we routinely take a scan. 
So here's the scan, the 3D template. We line everything up. And I want you to see this. Now look at what you're looking at here. He has a very thin buckle plate, I know. But look at the nerve. Look how it starts, then it bifurcates, comes together, and then bifurcates again. Would you want to be doing this endo? So when I saw this image on him, he's immediately going to our endodontist and good luck to her on this one. I couldn't treat this. Then I start looking at the width and I'm realizing I can't put an implant in here. There's no way. We have to save this tooth. We're going to do our darndest to save this tooth. So again, now you're looking at diagnosing, but you're also trying to figure out, do I want to treat this or refer it out? Think about just the time savings you saved by not starting this end out. So CBCT has become all encompassing in our decision making. Let's talk money. So we have different ways of looking at this. A five by five field of view routinely by our endodontist or a post-op is $99 and there's your code. If you're doing an FMX in our practice, we charge two and a quarter and that's our code. If we're doing a 15 by 13, getting the joints, sending it to a radiologist, that's our code, and we charge 350 for that. Now, are we doing medical billing? Yes. I'm not gonna get into it tonight, and don't ask me questions because we are doing it. I have two fully trained team members who do that, and we are billing medical cone beams. So I wanna now kind of transition into some cases, because I really think, why do I show this? I think the dentist is the general contractor. I don't like being dictated treatment by a specialist without knowing what's going on. So I believe as a general dentist, you are the general contractor. And this first case came to me, and this is already a number of years ago. He was 17 years old. He is the son of one of our patients. His dad's a preacher on the south side of Chicago. And he had extreme lower left sensitivity to cold. So he came in, he says, when I drink something cold, it can last minutes. Well, that's not good. So in our exam with him, and this is Dexas, you, normally you would see bite wing x-rays. We do not take bite wing x-rays on 17 years old, on 17 years old. We don't take them on 12 and 14 year old patients. We just don't take them. I'll start taking bite wings routinely if I need to, if I don't see something like in this case, but carry view is so much more diagnostic. So in this case, we'll, we'll do fluorescence, we'll do carry view, and I feel both are far more diagnostic than a fissure in 2D x-rays. But I didn't see his problem. I did not see why he was having cold sensitivity. So we did our carry view, we did our spectra, we took our intraoral images, and then we figured, since I couldn't see his lower left sensitivity, let's take a bite wing. And then we did a 10 by eight rapid scan. Let's, let's show the bite wing first. So the bite wing obviously shows a deeper cervical distal decay on number 18. This easily could be missed with carry view. Carry view is very, very appropriate when we're, when we're talking, sorry, when we're talking interproximal contact area. Carry view is great at looking at cracks and craze lines, love that. But here it's too cervical. So now I have this decay in the bite wing, and now we'll take our rapid scan CBCT, not a Panorex. And this is why I rarely, well, I, I can't even tell you the last time I took a Panorex. It's probably four or five years ago. Why would you take a 2D image versus a 3D image? And you, the only reason you would think would be radiation. That's what you would think and the radiation is minimally different. If you take a digital pan, it's about 20 to 30 microsievers. Now, when you look at this chart from Prexion, and this is a chart similar to others, if you look at the top, you see a rapid scan, a standard, then there's a HD and an ultra HD. On, on 
pretty much 99% of all of our patients under 21, we take a rapid scan. So as you scroll down rapid, you see what's in circle. That's 25 microsievers, which is just like a digital Panorex. So why wouldn't you take a comb beam? Then you look at the exposure time below the circle. It's 2.3 seconds. That thing just whips around the head. And it gives you a detailed enough image as you will see. So he's got an interior open bite, so we need to ortho. You can see his impacted wisdom teeth. And here's what's amazing. This is number 18. You can see the distal decay on number 18 here. And this is a low resolution comb beam. But it's got less radiation because he's a kid. Now you can start to see this impacted wisdom tooth. You can actually map a nerve within minutes with these systems and know how close that impacted tooth is to the nerve. You can actually measure it. In this case, it's almost it's a little under three millimeters. Great information that you would never know with a Panorex. So who decides best on the overall treatment? And I think this becomes critical. So in the old days, what would I have done? What would I have done? In the old days, I would have sent this to an oral surgeon, and the oral surgeon would have evaluated it. And I could have sent it to the orthodontist. But in this case, what I did was, instead of just sending it to the oral surgeon for wisdom teeth removal, I pulled the orthodontist in because the kid needs ortho, and I know he needs his wisdom teeth extracted, but I wanted to understand what my options were. So what's best for the patient here? What's best? So my why is keeping teeth to their 75th birthday. So on a 12-year molar, if I can keep it 75 years, that would get him to about his 87th birthday. So here's the question. Am I going to be able to keep this tooth in his mouth for 67 more years because the kid's whatever, 17 years old? What's the likelihood of A, a root canal with prolonged cold sensitivity? He's going to need a root canal. Then I'm going to have to restore this after I take out number 17. What are the chances of that tooth being in his mouth for 67 years from now and the costs involved? And costs were a huge component of this. So by the time I pulled the oral surgeon in and the orthodontist and I did a team consult, what we decided was we're going to take out one in 16, 18, and 32 and move 17 into place for 18 as a virgin tooth. Now, I didn't know what we could do. That's why I brought the orthodontist into this to see, can we swing this tooth all the way around and in? And we did. So all I can say is, if I had just sent out to the oral surgeon in the old days, it would have been four wisdom teeth extracted, then endo, and either a large onlay or a crown, and then eventually an implant because it wouldn't last forever. I don't know if I'd get 25 years out of it. Who knows? You may have a defect on the distal of number 18 after the extraction. This is where being the general contractor really pays. And it happens all the time. So this is my neighbor. She's 50. She's seeing a dentist in Chicago. And this is why I no longer take an FMX. Her x-rays are forwarded to me from the previous dentist. So. Here's tooth number two, small perilous, asymptomatic. Number four, fractured, large composite with decay. Do you have enough information here to decide, do I want to do, do, I want to do that endo or do I want to take out that tooth? What do I want to do with number four? Should I do a post and core or an implant? What should I do? You're guessing two-dimensionally. So let's take a look at number four. I'm going to break her down area by area. So for those of you, this is the full template, axial, coronal, and sagittal. Here's tooth number four. So is a post and core with crown lengthening and a new crown her best option? That's a question. I'm evaluating also in this coronal image the buccal lingual width. I'm looking at the height available potentially for an implant. I could create with this comb beam, with a digital scan, 
a restorative driven implant guide to make a screw down ultimate crown. That would be my goal, not a cement down. Here's, here's the axial image of tooth number four. I can see that the two canals have merged into one. I can evaluate the buccal lingual width in this image. Another view of the coronal image shows the internal decay surrounding the gutta percha. So ideally, I'd have to redo the endo. And then the question is, is really what internally do I have left? And one of the guidelines of doing a post and core, when you do a post and core, is that you have to have one millimeter of internal feral effect thickness, one millimeter. There's no way I would have had one millimeter feral effect thickness. No way, because of all the internal decay. So again, the image is guiding my decision making. Now we'll go to tooth number two. It had the periapical radial lucency and it has a small periolus. No symptoms because it's got this small little draining. So let's take a look. This is tooth number two coronally. Look at the extent of the bone loss. You can see the buccal bone loss and why now you have a periolus. You can see the proximity of the sinus. You can see the palatal involvement of the palatal root. Now we go to tooth number two, still in the coronal image, and I'm just scrolling now through front to back. And now I'm looking at, how do I set this area up really for an implant? Am I gonna graft first? Am I gonna sinus lift? Am I gonna need a specialist? Am I gonna use a consult for this? This is where tooth by tooth, you're gonna be the GC. Even as I scroll further, now I see the palatal root and I see the potential sinus involvement. So now imagine this, you go in and you go, I'm gonna take out your tooth, Joanne. You take out the tooth and now you have your, your antral oral fistula. Now, do you have the skills to do that flap to cover that up or would you refer that out? Again, that's a bad surprise. I love the idea of knowing things before I go in. This is the axial image showing you the extent in the furcation and the buckle blowout. This is the sagittal image. Now you can actually see the proximity to the sinus. Are you prepared for this? Compare this to a 2D periapical image. It's night and day. Same patient. Root canals were done on 19 and 20. It looks pretty good. I don't know. I don't really see much. Let's still the same scan, 10 by 8 scan. Look at the difference now, three dimensionally. Now you have apical lesions. They're asymptomatic. Do you want to watch them? Do you want to retreat them? Do you want to follow them? If you want to follow them, what's your protocol? Should you be documenting? The answer is yes. So if they're asymptomatic, I don't think I want to touch those. Make your notes, measure where they're at, measure the distances, and make your notes. Number 29 and 30, looks okay. I see a puff of sealer. Look at the difference. Now I'm just lining them up again now on the right side. Look at the difference of what you see apically. Asymptomatic, what do you want to do? Do you want to watch, treat, or follow? You better document. This is why we need... A scan. This is just one patient. This is the coronal view. You can actually map the nerve and see how close this lesion is to the nerve. Again, do you want to refer it for a second opinion? You're going to now dictate to the endodontist, tell me what you think of these four teeth. To the periodontist, what would you want to do here? To your oral surgeon, this is how you are the general contractor you're gonna be coordinating the specialists. Can you imagine this woman, Joanne, going to an oral surgeon getting a scan, then he's got, that scan's gotta be sent to my wonderful endodontist, and then she's gotta get a scan, and if she doesn't like the scan, then she's gonna take another scan, and then they come back to me. That is so inefficient, so inefficient, because I'm the guy who's gonna be restoring this patient. Everything should be restoratively driven, health driven. It falls underneath all of us. So when I look at discussions and planning and smooth workflow and results, this is a coordinated case. I'll show you two coordinated, or I'll show you a few coordinated cases. So this is Dan, 
and he's 62 years old. And this was a few years ago already. It's crazy. So he comes in on a routine hygiene visit, and there's an asymptomatic lesion noted on tooth number 22. And my hygienist gets a stick there. The history is number 23 turned yellow years ago, and he had endo done way before he was a patient in my office. No restoration on the tooth. And per the patient, he was told that the tooth was dead. Number 22, no history on this tooth at all. No restorations, okay? Except this potential decay on the buckle of 22. He had orthodontics done in high school 42 years ago. And I'm gonna say, this is what you have to hear me out on. In our medical histories and dental histories, if someone says they had ortho, I absolutely look for a resorption. Each year we have seen between 25 and 40 patients come in with a history of ortho and they have external resorption. You get root resorption with orthodontics, why not external resorption? And another caveat to this is you have to understand why does that happen? Any trauma to the periodontal ligament can cause resorption. So I'm just telling you, no probing, and what happened was my associate saw him and said, I'm going to set you up to see Dr. Graham for a small restoration because she didn't see the extent of this. So they were scheduled for 30 minutes for a class five. So here's what happens. And the second thing I would tell you is I hate surprises. I've been doing this 35 years. So I do my morning. I get to the office a half hour. I review all, every patient before I'm going to see him, look at all the notes, all the x-rays, everything. When I saw that x-ray, I go, that's not normal. I walked in, tapped him on his shoulder, and said, I got to take a scan on you. I didn't even look at the lesion. I knew there was something fishy there. So I said, let's go take a look at the lesion. So this is a 3D rendering um, in Prexion. It's kind of like a bone rendering. And I just want you to see how accurate this is. What you see is the pulpal tissue. So not only do you see the, the bone level, you see the resorption lesion, you can see the pulpal tissue. So as I look at external versus internal resorption, I classify this case as either number one on the left or number two. I'm gonna say number two, because in the next slide you'll see it involves the nerve. So this is the money view, this is the coronal view. Why is this the money view? First off, it shows you the proximity to the nerve. So we pulp tested the tooth and it was non-vital. It's the money view because you can also see that the bone is much more cervical. So when I lay a flap here, this is an easy flap. There's no bone to remove. This will just be basically a resorbed lesion. And so here's the axial view. And now you can see the resorptive lesion has invaded the pulp. Okay, now what are you gonna do? I'm gonna discuss this case with my endodontist and decide how do we plan, develop a smooth workflow to get ultimately the best result. So I sent the scan to my endodontist and asked her, how do you wanna treat this? She said, if she did the endo first, she was worried then about the coronal micro leakage getting down the gutta percha, so she didn't wanna do the endo first. So I said, well, if I do the restoration first, that could screw you up. So I offered her the following solution. This is what I would do. I told her I would restore the buccal lesion. And what I would do is I would drill an access prep from the lingual down on tooth number 22, which I'll show you. I'll do the buccal lesion. I'll then let her do calcium hydroxide therapy for a couple of weeks, because that's what she believed and I believed you should do. She would do the final fill, and then I would do the final lingual access sealing. And that's what we did. So step one, I created endo access. So I took my eight, my 10, 15 file, didn't want to enlarge it at all. Just wanted access, you'll see why. Now I'm laying a flap. I know there's no bone to remove because of the scan. There's no surprises. So here's the flap, leaving proximal tissue, and there's the lesion. It's right there. Look, how, look at the rendering in the gray. 
So now you can see it's a 25 file. You can see the rendering is exactly the same thing. You can see, I haven't done anything. All I've done is lay a flap and done my access. Resorption lesions are perfectly clean, as you can see. There's no decay, they're perfectly clean. So now the key is I've got to block that canal, restore, and then let her do her calcium hydroxide therapy. Again, look at the extent of the defect. So again, all I'm gonna do is put some one to 50 epi, I'm gonna wrap it in some gauze, impregnate the area, stop that little bleeding, and then I'm gonna seal the dentin and protect the pulpal space. So this is what I do. I've already got a paper point, which I'll show you. You could have gutta perch in there. It's in the canal. So all I'm going to do is place either Theracal or a Calcimol, some kind of liner, light cure it in 20 seconds, just to protect that area. And then, and at that point, I'll remarginate, bevel my enamel, and there's my paper point. So what am I going to do? In this case, I'm going to only selective etch the enamel. After rinsing and suctioning drying, I took some universal bonding agent, in this case, all bond universal, for about 20 seconds, and I scrubbed it because it's a universal bonding agent. No bleeding going on into the preparation. After 20 seconds, I will air dry it with an air-only syringe, gentle, for a total of 10 seconds, and then I'll light cure. Yeah, I could have used a glass on RMGI, but I wanted a pretty result. I placed two layers of Gianneal flow, and then I sewed her up, sealed the access. This is four weeks later, four weeks. Ultimately, she completed the endo. Now, when you look at this, look at how we did this. And if you, if you think about this, we started it with a five by five. We did a high res in that case. I didn't take a 10 by eight because I was specific to the tooth. This allowed me to diagnose the condition, absolutely develop a discussion and a workflow. And we're three years later, and of course the tooth is doing fine, thankfully. So what happens? I basically can lower the patient's ultimate cost by coming up with the best decision, incredibly efficient way of diagnosing this, and the quality of care is right there. Coordinate case number two, discussions, planning, smooth workflow. So this is Cindy, she's 52 years old, and she has a history of orthodontics, and it's time to say goodbye to tooth number 10. She has no medical issues, she has way too high a smile line, way too high. And cosmetics is a key. I hate that. High smile line in cosmetics is a key. So now the question is, she doesn't want a flipper. I hate flippers. Can I do an immediate temp and how do I plan for this? CBCT. So we take the scan and as we line everything up, Here's her axial view. Now it's grainy because I pick opened up the enlarged this, and that's what happens with the pixels. Otherwise, it's just crystal clear. Because if you go back, that's how clear this is. This is just pixelated because I'm expanding it. So I see a defect on the lingual, and I see a defect distally. Coronally, here's your view. I see that the defect on the distal does not involve the canine. You can see the proximal bone of the canine. So the mesial canine is fine. I'm just going to have to figure out how do we drop this implant ideally. So here's the lesion from the sagittal view. So in the sagittal view here, you're going to be able to measure the width and the length and then go into your implant library and see what can I drop in. So here's, now we're just gonna plan. And planning, it takes no time at all. Easy library. So how do I plan? First, I'm gonna measure. So the width is about six millimeters, six and a half. I'm gonna wanna place it at least a millimeter in from the buckle. That gives me under maybe around five millimeters. So basically my implant's gonna be a three by three. It's not even gonna be a four by six. It'll come too close. I don't want that. I don't need that there. 
So I've measured the width. And now all I'm gonna do is after I measure the length, I'll go into my implant planning library and drop it in implant. And when you drop it in, it goes in all four screens. And as you line up your implant, it will change in all four screens. That's the beauty of simplicity. So here's the sagittal view. It shows the sinus. Okay, so I don't have to do anything with the sinus. I've got my buckle width, my lingual width, and this is exactly where I need to go. Now, I can make a surgical stent absolutely for my periodontist, and then, but I can also tell you, look at the trajectory of this. There is no way I'm gonna do a screw down unless it's an angled screw down. So the temporary is gonna be a challenge. There's no question this is gonna be a temporary, I'm gonna to have to screw in from the buckle, from the buckle. This is why I can't even begin to tell you why it's so predictable. So knowing up front that I'm gonna be screwing this in from the buckle, I still feel I'm gonna give her a pretty end result. So the surgeon does his thing, I think his thing's easier than my thing, and places the implant ideally where we had created the stem to do that. So this is what I do. A couple ways of doing this, and this is BioHorizons. So in order to do this, you can either use a you know, pre-made peak temporary cylinder. You screw that into place. You mark where you're gonna cut it off. I've got an open wound. I don't wanna be drilling in the mouth. I'll take it out of the mouth, cut it down. So now I'll have the ideal temporary. In other words, I, I'm, I'm just preparing my temporary peak abutment. Okay. So this is what you do then. Basically, you're gonna remove the internal screw in this system, and you're gonna take a longer cylinder. It just comes with the system. And basically the cylinder becomes a key part of this for access. You'll see where we're going. Now I go into my 3M, polycarbonate ion crown kit. I will now measure which, which ion crown for the lateral incisor will be best. In this diagram, it looks like it's from the lingual, the access hole, it's not. The access hole will be on the buckle. I knew it would be on the buckle based on the comb beam. Okay, so you're gonna drill a hole and basically place the temporary through the hole so you can have access to unscrew the entire thing. So I wanna be clear here. So you're gonna put a hole in your ion crown. You're gonna place the ion crown over your driver. So this way you can back the driver out and pull the peak abutment and your ion crown out all at once and then modify it for a beautiful emergence. So what do I do? After I get everything set up, I'll go micro etch the internal aspect of the iron crown, and then I'll put a little adhesive coating. In this case, it's a Riva coat from SDI. It has, uh, it has no solvent in it. I just can place it in like here. I don't even have to air dry it because there's no solvent. So I've now got my iron crown. I'm gonna load it up with my temporary material. I'm gonna insert it over my driver, and then as it sets up, I will back out the driver. So I still like to rotate the driver back and forth just a little bit so it doesn't have any potential of locking in. That's just my little technique. So after about three minutes, I will unscrew this and you can see the buckle access. Now, what have I done at this point? I'll put a little bit more Reva Cure on the abutment, on the, on the abutment and the ion crown, and I will light cure it and add flowable, polish everything to create the ideal emergence for a temporary. All predictable. So this is a polished temporary that she will go home with. Takes me 45 minutes to do this. I charge 600 bucks for it, but I don't want to go home with a flipper. I wouldn't want to do that. And ideally, this is what she goes home with. This is four months later. So when I take a digital impression, I'm gonna unscrew this off. I'm gonna, you can see the buckle access. 
Now, I'm obviously going to do a cement down on her. I'm not going to do a buccal access for the permanent crown. But you can see exactly how we were able to create the tissue and form the tissue. And the end result was gorgeous, but that's another day in my implant course. So the course tonight was meant to show you, or today, was meant to show you, this is my vision is how, to, how, how I did incorporate cone beams into my practice how it truly allows me to be far more efficient, whether I'm diagnosing with specialists or myself, coming up with treatment plans with myself or my specialists, and coordinating clinical care for my patients. That becomes the key part of cone beams. I will tell you every night, every day pretty much, I'm doing a really great vlog called The New Norm. You can see it on Catapult Education or at MidwayEDU.com. It's all about COVID, and we have thousands and thousands of followers. I interview great people. In the next two weeks, we're going to be doing products of what, what are the essential products we have to be looking at in the COVID and post-COVID era. I hope you come and join. It's called The New Norm. You can just Google it. My motto during this COVID time is be safe, be smart. If you need to reach me, I can be reached at lou at catapulteducation.com. I will now take some questions if you have some questions uh, before we start our weekend. Tim, I'll turn it over to you, pal. Dr. Graham, that was awesome. Thank you again. It's been a long week for all of us, even though we're kind of stuck at home. But uh, you guys have any questions for Dr. Graham, uh, if you just hold down on your space bar, it'll temporarily take you off a of mute, or you can type in the chat room right here. A um, couple of people said thanks to you. Great information. Um, wait a couple minutes or a couple seconds for any questions that anyone has. Well, Tim, just as they're doing that, I just want to thank you and Prexion for continuing to allow us truly to have what I call the quality education for whether your users or future users. I think you guys walk the walk, so thank you. Oh, thank you. I know we're all excited to get back out of our homes and uh, start working. If anyone uh, has any questions or wants a remote demo on the Prexion software, um, I've typed the web address in the chat room, but it's www.prexion.com. Um, and you can also email any of your questions to uh, lou at catapulteducation.com as well. Absolutely. All right, I think that uh, we're good. Okay. No you killed it, that's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody. You have a great, safe weekend. Be safe, thank you. Yeah, if you guys put the correct email address in when you registered, you will get the video of this. Thanks, everyone.